Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India We are into 15th lecture of our course on ADR and arbitration. We saw what shall be the composition of tribunal, what shall be the powers of tribunal, how the tribunal is going to conduct the proceedings. And in the last lecture, we discussed how the tribunal is going to make an award, what are the contents of an award, what is the form of an arbitral award under what circumstances the proceedings shall terminate and there are few circumstances when the mandate of arbitrators, mandate of the tribunal revives even after the award is passed. So therefore we have come to the stage where the award has been passed by the tribunal on the basis of whatever law they must have designated. Recall our discussion on section 28. We said that parties have the freedom if the arbitration is ICA, International Commercial Arbitration, parties have the freedom to designate the substantive law. In section 19, we discussed that parties have the freedom to designate procedural law. So on the basis of application of these laws which parties designate, an award shall be passed by the tribunal. And now we have a session on recourse against the arbitral award. What will happen in case one of the parties is not satisfied with the award? What recourse can he take against the arbitral award is what we propose to discuss in this 15th lecture of our course. This is an important provision. Section 34 is a very important provision. This is the only section we have in chapter 7 of the Act. Chapter 7 contains only one section. I said 34 is on recourse against an arbitral award. You can file an application for setting aside of arbitral award in case you are not satisfied with the content of the award. In case you are an aggrieved party, you can file an application for setting aside the arbitral award under section 34. It is the most important provision because it is most significant in the delicate task of balancing between party autonomy on one hand and judicial control on the other because the act balances the two seemingly competing claims, party autonomy and judicial control, court intervention. Because this is one provision where if court intervenes, if court interferes, the, the, the arbitral award will go. So the most significant court intervention in this act is provided in section 34. As I said, section 34 can be invoked by way of application, but the act does not prescribe any format of the application. But it is relevant to mention here that this application will lay the foundation of all the evidences which parties would like to adduce. The provision also says that the application has to be filed according to section 34 subsection 2 and 34 subsection 3. Now before I go ahead, let me point out something which is relevant and which is new in section 34. Now section 34 says that the court shall limit to the submissions or the material available with the tribunal on record. So while challenging an arbitral award in section 34 before a court, you have to rely on the material on record with the tribunal and cannot go, court cannot go beyond that. So what I am trying to say, there is a connection between the point which I just mentioned and section 34 subsection 5, subsection 6. The proceedings of section 34 according to the provision, the proceedings of section 34 has to be completed 
in a time frame of one year. It was realized that this time frame is difficult to achieve for a, for a court if court has to go beyond whatever is available on record with the tribunal. Therefore, we have limited the scope in section 34 for the court to only limit itself to the material on record with the arbitral tribunal and don't travel beyond that so that it can dispose of the proceeding, it, it can dispose of the matter within the time frame of one year. So an application has to be filed, the application must lay down the foundation of all the evidences which parties would like to adduce and the application has to be filed according to 34.2 and 34.3. There are some preliminary observations about section 34. This is not a provision of review or appeal in the way we understand. Arbitral tribunal is not going to be reviewed by the court on traditional grounds of judicial review. That is error of law, error of fact. There are fixed grounds given in 34 on which the arbitral award is going to be reviewed. If the necessary formalities have been followed, by the arbitral tribunal. Correct procedure has been followed by the arbitral tribunal. Then whether you like it or not, it is binding. The award is binding and such an award cannot be set aside on traditional grounds of error of law, error of law, illegality, irrationality, procedural impropriety, the grounds of judicial review which you understand which you must have read in administrative law also. So, if technicalities, formalities have been followed by the tribunal, if correct procedure has been followed by the tribunal, then, then the award passed by the tribunal cannot be set aside on traditional grounds of error of law, error of fact. I will read an observation of Union of India versus A.L. Ralia Ram, the Supreme Court observation in the case of Union of India versus A.L. Ralia Ram that explains the scope of section 34. Court observed that Kindly see the observation of Supreme Court in the case of Union of India versus A.L. Raliyaram. The court observed that the award of the arbitrator is ordinarily final and conclusive unless a contrary intention is disclosed by the agreement. So, award is generally final and conclusive. The award is the decision of a domestic tribunal chosen by the parties. And the civil court, which are entrusted with the power to facilitate arbitration. See, the civil court has the responsibility to facilitate arbitration. It has the responsibility to effectuate the awards. Such civil court cannot exercise appellate power. It cannot exercise appellate power over the decision. So, this is not the power of appeal. This is not a review provision. This is not an appeal provision. The court observed that wrong or right, the decision is binding. If it is reached fairly and after giving adequate opportunity to the parties to place their grievances in the manner provided by the agreement. So, the role of the court in section 34 is to facilitate arbitration, to effectuate the awards. And while exercising that role, court cannot exercise appellate powers over the decision. Right or wrong, the decision is binding. If it is proved that it is reached fairly and it has been reached after giving adequate opportunity to the parties to place their matter, place their grievances according to the manner provided in the act, provided in the agreement. So, this is the general observation about section 34. Keep in mind always while studying section 34 that we are not studying a provision of judicial review. It is not an appeal provision. Now, with this understanding, let us see what are the grounds provided in section 34 subsection 2 on which you can challenge an arbitral award. The grounds are first incapacity of parties. Capacity of party is a continuous requirement. Parties did not have the capacity at the time of entering into the agreement. The award passed on the basis of such an agreement is liable to be set aside. 
even if they had the capacity to enter into the agreement if during the proceedings because of insanity maybe one of the parties lose capacity even in that case an award passed on the basis of such loss of incapacity of one of the parties is liable to be struck down set aside so first is incapacity of parties second ground is non existence of arbitration agreement or invalidity of arbitration agreement we have discussed this point validity in our discussion on section 8 section 11 the general principles of contract shall apply to decide whether the agreement in question is valid or not invalidity of arbitration agreement according to the law to which parties have subjected their arbitration to try and understand we don't have to examine the validity of arbitration agreement according to Indian law no we will examine the validity of arbitration agreement according to the law to which parties have subjected their arbitration to. it can be law of some other country so therefore you have some party autonomy there also and as I said general principles of contract will apply there must be free consent it must not be induced by force, fraud, coercion, undue influence. There must be consensus ad item, meeting of minds. If these things are missing, it is not a valid agreement. And any award passed on the basis of invalid agreement is liable to be set aside. This is the second ground. The third ground is non-compliance of due process. And it has got two aspects. First is the party was not given proper notice of appointment of arbitrators lack of notice if you recall we have discussed in section 24 that there is a requirement of fairness your code must be fair to both the parties and what do we mean by hearing what do we mean by fairness what do we mean by audi alterum partum Fairness starts from notice, continues till reasoning in the award. So if one party says that he was not given proper notice of the appointment of arbitrator, that becomes a ground for setting aside the arbitral award. What do we mean by proper notice? In relation to proper notice, some institutions have prescribed their own form. What is important is the notice must be real, must be definite. The notice must give ample time to the parties. And if such a notice is not given, it is not a proper notice and therefore right to be heard is violated. And if right to be heard is violated, that is a ground for setting aside the arbitral award. So the third ground is due process, non-compliance of due process requirements. It has got two aspects. I just mentioned the first lack of proper notice, lack of adequate notice. And second, inability of a party to present his case. Section 18 of the Act is the equality provision of this Act. It obliges the tribunal to remain equal with both the parties. And at any point of time, if a party is prevented from presenting his case, it is incumbent on that party to raise this issue, raise an objection immediately before the tribunal. If the tribunal finds the objection sustainable, it should give him an opportunity to present his case. If the tribunal rejects the objection, the decision of the tribunal is reviewable by the court once the award is passed. So this is the second aspect of due process requirement. I am saying that I was not given sufficient opportunity to present my case. There are two possibilities. If, if the tribunal agrees to my objection, it will give me an opportunity to present my case. Second, if the tribunal does not agree to my objection and says that your objection is wrong, in that case, the decision passed by the, such a tribunal, the award passed by such a tribunal is reviewable. So first ground is incapacity of parties, then in non-existence or invalidity of arbitration agreement. The third is non-compliance of due process. Fourth is exceeding jurisdiction. Tribunal exceeded the jurisdiction. What do you mean by jurisdiction? Tribunal is deciding a matter which is not contemplated or not falling within the terms of submission agreement. And keep in mind, I am not using the word arbitration agreement, I am using submission agreement.
so you and me may agree that in case a dispute arises we will refer the matter for arbitration that is an arbitration agreement tomorrow when the dispute arose out of three disputes we referred dispute number one and two to the tribunal this is actual act of submission submission agreement now the award relates to something which was never submitted to the tribunal that means the tribunal has exceeded its jurisdiction award contains decisions on matters which were never submitted to the tribunal this is a case of exceeding jurisdiction and if that is the case the award is liable to be struck down liable to be set aside but you have a principle called principle of separability which now finds place in the statute section 34 2a 4 the proviso incorporates this principle of separability which says that if court can separate the invalid part from the pallid part then only the invalid portion will be set aside so that the valid portion remains valid this finds place in the provisor to section 34 to a 4 prior to 1996 in the old act we did not have such a principle of separability but courts evolved this principle this is a judicially evolved principle and it is there in ancestral model law also so even in 1940 act courts used to apply the principle of separability and instead of setting aside the whole of the award courts will prefer to separate the valid part from invalid part so that only the invalid portion is set aside and remaining part remains valid so this is the fourth ground exceeding jurisdiction incapacity invalidity due process exceeding jurisdiction fifth ground 34 to a 5 the fifth ground is that the composition of tribunal and the procedure followed by the tribunal is invalid invalidity of composition invalidity of procedure followed by the tribunal now if you recall while discussing section 10 in the case of narayan prashad lohia versus nikunj kumar lohia we have discussed the meaning of section 34 2a 5 because this was one of the issues involved in that case and court in narayan prashad lohia explained the meaning of 34 2a 5 says that as long as the composition of the tribunal and the procedure followed by the tribunal are valid according to the terms of the agreement between the parties it is valid no more inquiry needs to be done it is only when you do not have an agreement on composition it is only when you do not have an agreement on procedure to be followed that the court can go and examine the composition and procedure with respect to the mandatory provisions of part one of the act so therefore how do you decide how the court is going to decide invalidity of composition or invalidity of procedure to be followed first step compare the composition compare the procedure with the agreement of the parties if it is in accordance with the agreement fine but if the agreement is silent on this point it does not talk about composition how many arbitrators should be there how it does not talk about procedure in that case the composition and the procedure will be examined by comparing it with the mandatory provisions of part one of the act that is what we have discussed in narayan prashad lohia versus nikunj kumar lohia when it comes to composition you refer to sections 10 to 15 we have discussed all these provisions all these provisions relate to composition of arbitral tribunal violation of any one of these would lead to a situation where the award passed by such a tribunal is liable to be set aside so invalidity incapacity invalidity due process exceeding jurisdiction faulty composition faulty procedure these are the five grounds given in section 34 2a on which an arbitral award may be challenged may be set aside may be struck down in addition to these five grounds which have to be pleaded and proved by the parties we have two additional grounds in 34 2b the difference between 34 2a grounds and 34 2b grounds 
is that the grounds of clause A have to be pleaded and proved whereas grounds of clause B need not be pleaded court will take cognizance of these grounds on its own and these are an award which is in violation of public policy of India is liable to be set aside an award in relation to a subject matter which was not arbitrable an award in relation to a subject matter which was not arbitrable in the first place such an award is liable to be set aside so therefore we have total of seven grounds as of now we i discussed i mentioned seven grounds on which an arbitral award may be set aside and this is an exhaustive list as i already mentioned in the beginning itself that traditional grounds of error of law error of fact cannot be used to set aside an arbitral award so these are the seven grounds first five are to be pleaded and proved in relation to last two grounds that is violation of public policy of India and non arbitrability of subject matter court can take cognizance of these grounds on its own. Now out of these two grounds violation of public policy and non arbitrability I will take first in this session and we will talk about non arbitrability in the next lecture. Let us see what is the meaning of violation of public policy of India. See, these expressions public policy of India or opposed to public policy or contrary to public policy these are incapable of precise definition we will we will accept it in constitutional law in law of contract you must have discussed cases in which the phrase public policy has been discussed. Central Inland Water Transport Corporation versus Brajanath Ganguly, if you recall, in which the Supreme Court refers to the observation given in the English case of Richardson versus Mellish, in which Lord Denning said that public policy is an unruly horse, and once once you astride it, you never know where it will take you. In another case, the court again observed that with a good man in saddle this unruly horse can be made to jump obstacles. So therefore there are opinions from both the sides that public policy is a subjective term on the other hand public policy may have objective content. So that is a problematic area yes and therefore we have two schools of thought the narrow view the broad view narrow view proponents would not like to invent new heads in public policy whatever precedents will say about the meaning of public policy the narrow view proponents will not like to invent new heads under public policy whereas in broad view the broad view proponents will not hesitate in expanding the scope of public policy by inventing new heads but this discussion is going on as I said according to the narrow view courts cannot create new heads of public policy whereas the broad view continences judicial law making in this area the adherents of the narrow view should would not invalidate a contract on the ground of public policy unless that particular ground had been well established by the authorities they will not invent new heads under public policy. But there are cases where courts have held that public policy is a dynamic concept. Practices which were considered perfectly normal at one point of time have today become obnoxious, oppressive to public conscience. Public policy therefore is a dynamic concept. Something which was in accordance with public policy at one point of time is not in accordance with public policy today. So there is temporal variation not only temporal variation there is spatial variation something in accordance with public policy in India may not be in accordance with public policy in some other country. So public policy of different countries will also vary and if there is no head of public policy which covers my case then it is the responsibility of the court to invent new heads keeping in view the aspects of public interest so that my case also gets resolved. So therefore it is the responsibility of court to invent new heads 
so as to mitigate chances of injustice on the assumption that public policy varies from place to place and public policy varies from one point of time to other point of time. But then there is a problem. What should be the guideline keeping in mind according to which the courts must invent heads within the phrase public policy? Do we have guidelines? Yes, we have the guidelines. Courts have said in various cases that there are sufficient guidelines in your constitution. For example, the preamble to the constitution itself is a good guideline for the courts for the purpose of expanding the scope of public policy of India. Keep in mind the preamble that will guide you. The fundamental rights chapter, the directive principles enshrined in our constitution, these are guiding principles for the courts to invent new heads within the phrase public policy of India. The issue of setting aside of an award on the ground of public policy of India arose in the case called as Renu Sagar Power Company Limited versus General Electric Company. The issue of violation of public policy as a ground for setting aside an award. In fact, this case relates to a foreign award. Therefore, the matter relates to something which we have in part 2 of the act. I will talk about part 2 later on, but let me tell you briefly that part 2 in section 48 provides for grounds on which enforcement of a foreign award may be challenged. Part 2 in section 48 contains grounds on the basis of which enforcement of a foreign award in India may be opposed. We will talk about those grounds in later lectures. One of the ground there is if the foreign award is violative of public policy of India, then its enforcement may be opposed. So, we have public policy of India as a ground for setting aside an award in section 34 and we have violation of public policy of India as a ground for opposing a foreign award. Now, this case relates to foreign award and in fact, this case relates to the act of 1961 if you remember which has now been reenacted in the form of chapter 1 of part 2 of the act. We will talk more about it later. So, what is the meaning of public policy was an issue here in Renu Sagar Power Company Limited. Let me tell you once again that this case relates to enforcement of foreign award. This is not an award which is challenged in section 34 here. It has to be enforced in India. Now, in this case, court said that public policy of India must be given a narrow meaning. And therefore, there are three things which are included in the meaning of public policy of India. Why do we want to give narrow meaning? Because court explained it. Court says that we are talking about enforcement of foreign award. We are not talking about a domestic award. It is not a domestic context. Since we are talking about an award coming from some other country, so, we are talking about something which is a matter of private international law, conflict of laws. We cannot give expansive meaning to our law or words used in our law because that will lead to conflict situation. So, restricted meaning, narrow meaning must be given to this phrase public policy of India because we are dealing with a foreign award. Two different jurisdictions are involved. Further, court also says that this is a secondary stage of inquiry. This award was passed in some country, country A, for which it was a domestic award. Because you see, whether it is domestic award or a foreign award, that depends on place of arbitration. So, suppose this award was passed in England, for England it is a domestic award. And if it is a domestic award in England, it is liable to be challenged in England under their section 34 kind of provision, you see. 
in whatever country it is passed in that country the award is a domestic award and in their law the domestic award can be challenged in their section 34 kind of provision and by and large after ancestral model law oh we have harmonized the conditions by and large the conditions are similar so because this award has already been tested at at one forum in the country where it was passed as a domestic award examining this award again in india in 48 kind of provision would mean this is an examination of second level at the level of execution and we all understand that the grounds which you get to challenge something at At, at the first instance are wider as compared to the grounds which you get at the level of execution to challenge it because we are talking about execution of a foreign award in india it's a ground at secondary level so the grounds have to be narrow so these are the two justifications given by the supreme court or these are justifications on the basis of which a narrow meaning was proposed a narrow meaning of public policy of india will have three things fundamental policy of indian law interests of india justice or morality so if the award is violative of fundamental policy of indian law it is against public policy of india if the award is violative of interests of india it is violative of public policy of india if it is against notions of justice morality it would mean violation of public policy of india a narrow meaning is given because we are dealing with private international law a narrow meaning is justified because this is the second level of inquiry because the award has already been tested in the country where it was passed as a domestic award a narrow meaning has to be given because you see mutual trust is the glue which holds international arbitrating community together if we create problems in enforcement of foreign award in india they will start creating enforcement of awards going from india to their country and the trust will be missing in order to avoid that situation i will allow narrower grounds to challenge and expect them to have narrower grounds to challenge so this is the context in which supreme court in the case of renu sagar power limited versus general electric company gave the meaning of public policy of india saying that we are giving a narrow meaning in the domestic context in the context of section 34 the meaning of public policy was explained in the case of ongc limited versus saw pipes limited i refer to this case while discussing section 283 if you remember in ongc limited versus saw pipes limited 2003 supreme court the issue was there was an agreement the the contract contract provided that some penalty may be imposed in case of delayed supply of materials supply got delayed penalty was imposed the other party raised a, an issue the matter was referred to the tribunal and tribunal says that no you were wrong in imposing the penalty i'll repeat listen to me carefully in this case there was a contract which provided the contract provided that in case of delayed supply of goods some penalty may be imposed supply was delayed therefore penalty as stipulated in the contract was imposed the other party was saying that you are wrong in imposing the penalty i am saying it is according to the contract between you and me the other party invokes the arbitration clause arbitration commenced an award is passed the tribunal says that the penalty must not have been imposed the fine must not have been imposed you cannot claim damages unless you prove loss now i am saying that when the contract so clearly says that i can impose fine i am imposing it i am working within the contract and if you are deciding the case in violation of the contract if the tribunal is deciding the case ignoring the terms of the contract that would mean violation of section 283 let me go back to what i discussed in 283 for a moment 
28.3, I said, is amended in 2015. And I also mentioned, if you recall, in the last class itself, 28.3 was amended to reverse the decision of ONGC versus saw pipes, the case which we are discussing now. Prior to the amendment in 28.3, it was written that, that in all cases the arbitral tribunal is bound by the terms of the contract between the parties. Now, it says that in all the cases the arbitral tribunal shall take into account the terms of the contract. The two things are different. The law which existed prior to 2015 which said that in all cases arbitral tribunal is bound by the terms of the contract, that is the law which existed when this case was decided. So law provided that tribunal shall decide according to terms of the contract and tribunal is deciding ignoring the term of the contract. This is violative of section 28.3. But violation of a statutory provision, listen to me carefully, violation of a statutory provision, suppose parties have said that no reason is to be given, section 31, subsection 3, tribunal still gives reason, it is violating 31.3. What are the consequences of violation of a statutory provision? How can you set aside, how can you challenge an award which has been passed in violation of statutory provision? Whether it is provision of arbitration act or a provision of some other act, suppose an award has been passed in violation of provision of say transfer of property act or sale of goods act. Such awards are illegal awards. But do we have illegality as a ground in section 34? I will tell you the grounds once again, incapacity, invalidity, due process, exceeding jurisdiction, faulty composition procedure, violation of public policy of India, non-arbitrability of subject matter. Do we have a ground called as illegality of the award? An award is liable to be set aside if it is passed in violation of some statutory provision. No, we do not have a ground. The only option is to look into the meaning of public policy of India, the meaning given in Renu Sagar, the meaning given is an award which is violative of fundamental policy of India, an award which is against interests of India, an award which is against notions of justice and morality, only such awards are against public policy of India, even in that definition, you do not have patent illegality. If I refer to the explanation of section 34 and I include Renu Sagar judgment, the meaning of public policy is an award which is induced by fraud or corruption, an award which is passed in violation of section 75 and 81 of this act, 75, 81 relate to confidentiality, we will talk about these provisions later on when we will discuss part 3 of the act. So, an award which is induced by fraud, corruption, an award which is violative of sections 75 and 81, an award which violates fundamental policy of Indian law, an award which is against interests of India and an award which is against notions of justice and morality. These are the five points. Only in these situations you can say that the award is violative of public policy of India. This is what we had till. Renu Sagar, what ONGC does, ONGC adds one more aspect in this list, in addition if the award is patently illegal. If the award is patently illegal, such an award is considered as violative of public policy of India and such an award is liable to be set aside. This judgment provoked considerable adverse comments because now we are allowing illegality as a ground for setting aside the arbitral award and in the beginning itself I said that the traditional grounds of review, illegality, irrationality, etc. shall not be available here. But because of this judgment, the one of the traditional ground of judicial review finds place in the list of grounds on which you can challenge an arbitral award. 
so meaning of public policy has been expanded and court in this case said that we are expanding the meaning we are going beyond what renu sagar judgment says because renu sagar is what private international law situation renu sagar judgment is foreign award situation ongc is a domestic award situation so within domestic context we can afford to have a wider meaning and in for in, in relation to foreign awards let's have narrow meaning this is what supreme court said in ongc versus saw pipes so let me once again summarize whatever i said in relation to public policy of india i said public policy of india can admit broad meaning there can be narrow meaning we have proponents from both the sides but there are judgments where courts have said that broad meaning is is acceptable there are guiding principles in the form of preamble of the constitution fundamental rights directive principles so judiciary must not shy away from inventing new heads when it comes to administration of justice renu sagar power case is a situation of enforcement of foreign awards court said we are giving narrow meaning there are five points i just mentioned award is obtained by fraud corruption in violation of 71 75 81 violation of fundamental policy of india against interests of india against justice morality what ongc case did it added one more point here specifically saying that we are doing it in the context of domestic award so therefore therefore after ongc we understood that the word public policy will have different meaning in 34 will have different meaning in 48 the term public policy of india will have broad meaning including patent illegality in 34 and will have narrow meaning without having patent illegality in section 48 this was the situation now another trend which needs mention here is the approach of courts in india in relation to section 48 ongc clarified that we are giving broad meaning only in the context of 34 and will have narrow meaning of renu sagar in the context of section 48 48 as i said is giving you grounds on which enforcement of foreign award may be challenged and violation of public policy of india is one of the grounds there also now you see there are three four cases identified here in the case of shivnath rai hari narayan 2008 supreme court relied on renu sagar rightly relied on renu sagar and not on ongc to construe the meaning of public policy because this case relates to foreign award this case relates to section 48 so they took the meaning of public policy from the judgment of renu sagar which was given with respect to foreign awards but then in 2011 in the case of phool chand exports limited you see phool chand exports limited versus o o o patriot phool chand exports limited versus o o o patriot in this case supreme court held that patent illegality needs to be considered even with respect to section 48 so the problem is now wide meaning is acceptable wide meaning of public policy of india is acceptable even in case of section 48 now this case disturbs the landscape ongc kept broad meaning for 34 narrow meaning for 48 but phool chand exports judgment extends broad meaning even for 48 but fortunately in the year 2014 in the case of sri lal mahal limited versus progetto grano supreme court overruled the judgment of phool chand and once again accepted that the judgment of renu sagar which says that narrow meaning with respect to foreign awards be accepted for section 48 now the judicial flip flop was causing confusion and therefore law commission suggested certain changes the law commission recommended that for the avoidance of doubt the meaning of public policy of india needs to be clarified and law commission says that 
in section 34, you see, I said narrow meaning of Renu Sagar, broad meaning of ONGC. Public policy was given broad meaning. What law commission says, if the award is induced by fraud, by corruption, if it is violative of section 7581, so you have one, two, three. These three were there before. These three have been retained by the law commission also. Then we added three points in Renu Sagar, fundamental policy of India, fundamental policy of Indian law, interests of India, justice and morality. And after ONGC, patent illegality. So in addition to the three points mentioned here, we had four points within the meaning of public policy of India after ONGC. What law commission says, out of these four, law commission keeps just two. So the fourth point is, if the award violates the fundamental policy of Indian law, and fifth is, if it conflicts with the most basic notions of morality and justice. This is all. Interests of India has been dropped by the Law Commission recommendation. Why? Because according to Law Commission, interests of India is a vague expression. And let's not have vague expressions within the meaning of public policy of India. So they dropped interests of India from that list. And they also dropped patent illegality from the meaning of public policy of India. In place of justice or morality, they have written most basic notions of justice or morality. So, patent illegality is not a part of violation of public policy of India. That was clarified. This was included in section 34 by way of 2015 amendment. The recommendation of law commission was accepted. In addition to the meaning of public policy of India, law commission gives one more subsection 34 to capital A, where patent illegality has been recognized as a separate ground for setting aside an arbitral award, not as part of violation of public policy of India, no. It is removed from the definition of violation of public policy of India. Now it is a separate ground on which an award may be set aside. But this is available only for an arbitration other than international commercial arbitration. So therefore, try and understand, Law Commission suggested that pure domestic arbitrations, arbitrations between Indians in India be treated differently from international commercial arbitration. International commercial arbitration is an arbitration where one party has got international character. Let us treat these two differently and let us keep this as a separate ground, patent illegality as a separate ground only for pure domestic arbitration. That means an arbitration other than international commercial arbitration and let us not have this as ground for international commercial arbitration. Now, if I sum up quickly. What are the grounds? There are eight grounds for pure domestic arbitration and there are just seven grounds for international commercial arbitration. In, incapacity, invalidity, due process, exceeding jurisdiction, faulty composition procedure, violation of public policy of India, non-arbitrability of subject matter. These are the seven grounds which you have for setting aside an award passed under international commercial arbitration. In addition to these seven grounds, you have an additional ground for pure domestic arbitration. That is an arbitration between Indians in India. And that additional ground is patent illegality of the arbitral award. What do we mean by patent illegality? The award shocks the conscience of, 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 of a right thinking man. Such an award which is patently illegal, the illegality is apparent on the face of record. Such awards are liable to be set aside only in an arbitration other than international commercial arbitration. Now, when this amendment was suggested and the meaning of public policy of India was narrowed down further, the meaning now we have in the provision is even narrower than the narrow meaning given in Renu Sagar Power Company case. In Renu Sagar, we got a narrow, narrow meaning. In ONGC, we got a broad meaning. Now the Law Commission gives even narrower meaning as compared to Renu Sagar. Interest of India goes, patent illegality goes, 
justice morality becomes most basic notions of justice morality when the amendment was proposed it was assumed that fundamental policy of indian law would not be construed widely will not be interpreted widely but very soon another judgment called as ongc versus western gecko international limited ongc versus western gecko international limited 2014 was decided by the supreme court in which the question was what is the meaning of fundamental policy of indian law i just said that when amendment was done in 2015 it was done on an assumption that no expansive meaning will be given to the phrase fundamental policy of indian law but in the case of ongc versus western gecko international limited the supreme court when it got an opportunity to explain the meaning of fundamental policy of indian law it expanded the meaning there are three things which according to supreme court will definitely form part of fundamental policy of indian law which are part and parcel of fundamental policy of indian law first is judicial approach second is principles of natural justice and third is perverse or irrational finding i'll explain these points briefly court said these three are definitely part and parcel of fundamental policy of indian law first is judicial approach every authority every court which is going to affect rights of citizens or whose decision will lead to civil consequences is obliged to adopt what is called as judicial approach it means that the authority must not act in whimsical manner it means that the authority must act on the basis of submission made by the parties so any authority which is obliged to take decisions which is going to have civil consequences will adopt judicial approach second is principles of natural justice every court every quasi judicial authority must act in accordance with principles of natural justice this is one of the aspects of fundamental policy of indian law these two were not problematic problem came here in third point court says a decision which is perverse a decision which is so irrational that no reasonable person would have arrived at cannot be sustained and therefore perversity and irrationality of decision is a ground for setting aside an arbitral award perversity and irrationality is a ground for setting aside the arbitral award because a perverse finding or irrational decision is violative of fundamental policy of indian law you see there is a principle called as wednesbury principle wednesbury principle you must have discussed about wednesbury principle you must have studied about wednesbury principle in your administrative law there are three grounds of judicial review illegality irrationality procedural impropriety we said illegality is not a ground at least in international commercial arbitration it is not part of public policy violation of public policy of india we excluded it on the basis of recommendation of law commission now what court is doing in western gecko it is adding irrationality we are going back to the same definition so through wednesbury principle illegality and ir irrationality come back to the meaning of fundamental policy of indian law and therefore come back to the meaning of violation of public policy of india now this judgment disturbed the whole scheme and therefore law commission had to come with a supplementary only for the purpose of suggesting another explanation to be added in section 342 which has been added in the statute it now says in the name of reviewing the award or while applying the fundamental policy of indian law the court shall not review the award on merits so that additional explanation the new explanation which is added on the basis of supplementary report of law commission in 
that was added only to reduce the effect of the judgment of ONGC versus Western Gecko International Limited, which added again through backdoor irrationality and in invalidity within the meaning of public policy of India. These are not part of violation of public policy of India. Now, going back to the decision of ONGC versus saw pipes, as mentioned before, because of the amendment in section 28.3, the decision is reversed now. The tribunal is not bound by the terms of the contract. Tribunal has to keep in mind the terms of the contract. After the amendment, the question is what shall be the decision of the court on the facts of ONGC? If the case is to be decided today, it was an international commercial arbitration. And if it is an international commercial arbitration, then patent illegality is not, not a ground for setting aside the award. The next part is, will your answer be different if both the parties are Indian parties? If both the parties are Indian parties, it becomes a pure domestic. Patent illegality is a ground. But unfortunately, if we decide it today, it would not mean violation of 28.3, the amended 28.3. And if it is not violation of 28.3, no illegality is committed. Go back to whatever I just mentioned and try to answer the questions raised here. In both the cases, if ONGC is to be decided today, whether it is ICA or pure domestic arbitration, the judgment will be that the award is not liable to be set aside. Kindly think about whatever I said on this point and try to answer these questions. We discussed the grounds of section 34.2a and the ground of violation of public policy of India for challenging the award. The other aspects of section 34 including arbitrability of dispute, limitation for challenging an award and the issue of enforcement of an award shall be discussed in the next lecture. Thank you very much for attending the session. Thank you. Hello and welcome to this piece of literary snippet. We usually know William Shakespeare as the most revered figure in the history of English literature. But we often tend to forget that he has also been one of the most hated figures in literature. And here I am not talking only about those boys and girls who have to memorize uh, long sections from Macbeth or King Lear or Julius Caesar uh, before they can go and sit for their school and, or college exams. But I am also talking about people who are themselves quite famous authors. Tolstoy, for instance, considered the writings of Shakespeare to be, and I quote, crude immoral, vulgar, and senseless. George Bernard Shaw absolutely loathed Shakespeare, as he did Homer. But perhaps no other criticism about Shakespeare is more damaging than the one which says that Shakespeare is a marvelous storyteller, provided someone has told him the story earlier. Now, this piece of criticism is particularly damaging because it is true. None of Shakespeare's plays contain any original story whatsoever. They are all written using pre-existing materials, pre-existing stories. Now, does that diminish the stature of Shakespeare as a dramatist? Well, I'll leave that for you to decide. See you in the next episode of Literary Snippets. <laughs>